Good night, Papua New Guinea. I'm Malcolm Waira, and welcome to another episode of In Focus. Tonight, we discuss the recently launched review of the form and systems of government, the election of the Prime Minister by the people. The review was launched by the Prime Minister, Honorable James Marape, and the Constitutional Law Reform Commission Chairman, Honorable Saki Soloma, on the 15th of February in Port Mosby. Joining us for discussions tonight is Dr. Mange Matui, the Secretary for the Constitutional and Law Reform Commission. We also have Mr. Xavier Winia, the Director, Legal Research and Publication. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you, Malcolm. Okay. Uh, just from the outset, as the Secretary for the Constitutional and Law Reform Commission, can you briefly explain the core mandate and functions of the institution? Thank you very much, uh, Malcolm. Uh, our name is Constitutional and Law Reform Commission. Our job is basically review and reform of laws uh, in the country. When you look at all the laws in the country provided under the Constitution, our job is from time to time, upon direction from the government, we review each of those laws. And one of those important laws is the uh, constitutional uh, uh, law. Uh, and within the constitutional law, you have the Constitution that basically provides for the different uh, system of government uh, and different uh, uh, branches of government. When you look at our uh, uh, law also, you have to look at the Constitution as well as the uh, Constitutional and Law Reform Commission uh, Act, which basically provides for powers and functions. Those powers and functions are very, very specific. We look at all the uh, obsolete laws, we review them. Defects in laws, we review them. We also look at the laws uh, uh, dating back prior to 1975. We look at them and, and see whether or not they are still current and applicable to the current circumstances and also review all the other laws that are passed by Parliament from 1975 to current. And we look at them and we review all of them. So when you look at it, uh, our job is basically law review and reform uh, uh, in the country. Uh, you could look at our job more or less as a semi-academic institution that we are responsible for looking at the law, research into law, and recommend from time to time uh, of what laws that are needed to amend, be amended or changed. Yes. Uh, Mr. Winia, as I mentioned, we're currently discussing the review. Um, can you briefly explain how this review came about and the key matters that will be deliberated on yeah. this review? Malcolm, thank you. Um, basically, before this review was under, uh, is in progress now, what we have basically done is uh, in 2018, into 19, we completed a constitutional directive number two, and that was the review of the organic law and the local, uh, national and local government elections. And so one of the items that came about in that time during public consultation was the election of the prime minister, and it, it also came out at that time. What the constitutional law reform commission did was we didn't pick that to deal with that particular agenda because it was very big and it was broad. And so what we did was to pick it up as a separate item to be dealt with. And that's where you see now the coming, coming of the Constitutional Directive Number 4, which is the review and the form of a, a form and a system of government with a specific focus on the election of the Prime Minister. So that's the backdrop, backdrop of the, how this particular Constitutional Directive came about. It was basically emanated from the, the views of the people, actually, during that uh, previous review on the election law. The, the review you mentioned, um, the election of the Prime Minister is the main one, but I understand there are some mm -hmm. other aspects and key areas that you'll be reviewing. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, TORs that we are looking at is the uh, election of the Prime Minister. But Malcolm, the viewers, what the viewers should also uh, know is that we are also looking at other uh, issues which are equally important. Uh, after nearly 50 years of independence, uh, in 2025 we'll be reaching uh, 50 years of our, our civil ju uh, jubilee. Uh, and I think what the government is looking at is that uh, we have this system that has worked for us since 1975 until and now we are 48, going towards 49, 40, uh, 50, uh, uh, 50 years. We have to look back at what has actually worked for us and brought us this far. And so what we're basically doing is going back and looking at the, at the syst uh, system and form of government. We're not only looking at uh, one aspect, which is the election of the uh, Prime, Prime Minister, yes. but we are also looking at the three arms of the government, the executive, 
the legislature as well as the uh, uh, judicial arm uh, and see how they have worked so far since 1975. Not only we're looking at uh, uh, you know, uh, three arms of the government, we're also looking at the three-tier system of government that we adopted uh, in 1995. Uh, that is something important also we are, uh, we are looking at. We're not only looking at that, we're looking at the head of state, uh, the role of the head, uh, head of state, what the head of state has uh, uh, done so far since independence 1975 until now. And so we are looking at a wide uh, array of issues. Uh, and this are, uh, Malcolm, let me say this, that these are not new issues that we are looking at. These issues were basically being discussed by our uh, founding fathers in 1973, 1974. And they were actually uh, talking about, uh, you know, presidential system. They were actually talking about uh, who should be the head of state, who should be the head of government. Uh, those issues were looked at at that, uh, uh, at that time. Uh, and so, uh, after 50 years, we are now having that particular conversation about uh, the system has uh, worked for us and has brought us this far. And as a country, it's uh, important and it's healthy for us to have this conversation. When we are reaching 50 years and we are moving now from uh, 2025 into another 50 years or another 100 years, that is the kind of conversation uh, that a healthy society should be having, and we are having that conversation right now. Yes. I mean, to the, the conduction of the review itself, I understand there are certain processes and activities that you will be undertaking. Can you explain a few of those activities? You, your previous question was also relating to the methodology and the approaches that will be taken. Yes, that is something exactly. that, yeah, I haven't explained it. Um, basically, the approach is uh, public consultation. That's the approach, and you go back to 1972, 73, 74, that's the approach that our constitutional frame has basically adopted, and that's the similar approach here largely under But within that major approach, there are also specific methodologies that we use, and one of them is questionnaire interviews. And the interviews are open-ended questionnaires, that's just to guide and invoke or provoke uh, further discussions during the inquiries. Uh, the other method is right up of the technical papers, and that's something that we also, when there are technical issues that need to be, need technical thinking, that's where technical experts are engaged for that purpose. Uh, we are also looking at in terms of, uh, you, you, you will be there during the launching, and the questionnaire was electronically launched, yes. and that's, that's the approach that probably um, we are taking that approach to get as much people to participate in that one. So data that will be collected through the technical papers, through the public consultations, throughout the provinces and districts, as well as the true questionnaire surveys that was launched electronically. And also, there is also, a, I think, through the phone. So those are methodologies that we are using to collect sufficient data. And because as Secretary has mentioned, this is all massive, wider issues that we are looking at. And as much as possible, our aim is to apply methodologies that captures almost say majority of the people around the country to give their views on this particular review. Yeah, so. Thank you, gentlemen. We now go for a quick break. Join us on the other side for more discussions. <music> Welcome back. You're watching In Focus. I still have Dr. Matui and Mr. Xavier Winia in the studio with me. Um, gentlemen, the the current structure of the national parliament is, one of, as you mentioned, one of the key matters that this review seeks to discuss, especially whether to adjust from our current unicameral parliamentary system to a bicameral parliamentary system. Uh, can you explain the differences and the positives and the negatives of the both parliamentary system for the benefit of our viewers? I will start with Dr. Matui. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. This, this is one of the important uh, issues as well we are uh, taking out uh, to our people. Uh, uh, when we are talking about bicameral and unicameral system, we are basically talking about the, uh, the one par parliamentary system, uh, one house uh, uh, parliamentary system and two house parliamentary systems. Uh, bicameral uh, parliamentary system was discussed back in 1973, 1974. And when you look at the Constitutional Planning Committee report, that gave rise to our constitution. Uh, they've discussed this particular issue and they've decided that, well, the country is not ready to have a, uh, a bicameral uh, system. Uh, and that is why it, it is captured in our history books and we have that conversation. And I think that's an important thing that uh, 
uh, the country should know that we have that uh, conversation about whether to have a half house or a low house. When you look at other jurisdictions around the world, uh, particularly when you look at the Australia, uh, you have the upper house and the lower house. Uh, they call those houses the House of Representative uh, and the Senate. Uh, and so they have that particular example there for our people to be able to uh, look at. So that conversation uh, we had at that time uh, in 1973, 1974, uh, and captured uh, in that particular uh, report. Uh, the reason why we opted to go uh, with the one house of parliament uh, is simply because, and when you look at the reason given by uh, the CPC report was that uh, it is because the process, if we adopt the second one, a second house, uh, the process will be cumbersome. That when you are pushing through uh, a, a policy, the national policy, when you're pu pushing through a bill uh, to become an act of parliament, then you go through those different layers on the floor of parliament and it takes time to go through that particular process. And sometimes a particular law can be defeated at the lower house before it comes to the upper house. And so that was the basic reason given for them not to uh, go down that path. And there are other, uh, other reasons as well, but uh, that was one of the main reasons. But the important thing to note, uh, Malcolm, is that we are having that same conversation uh, after nearly 50 years. We are having that same conversation our forefathers have uh, about whether or not to have uh, two houses of parliament. Um, in terms of the form of government, uh, we currently have the three three tier system of government, the national, provincial, and local level government. Um, can you highlight for us what sort of uh, discussions uh, you are encouraging and expecting from this review regarding the current three tier system of government? I think we'll start with uh, Mr. Winnie. Yeah, you go back to 1974, Malcolm. And you see that uh, 1974, sorry, 1977 to 1995, you had a two-tier system with a provincial government system. And then we migrated from that two-tier to into the three-tier, which we currently have. And there were a number of reviews that were made also in regard to whether success and, uh, success and unsuccessful of the, the three-tier system. The questions that need to be asked and for the Papua New Guineans to also deal with is the issue of if we are going to look at three-tier arrangement. Will it be a uh, treaty, uh, sorry, will you move into current unicameral or by, uh, single parliamentary chamber? If you're going to move into presidential or uh, bicameral arrangement, the issues are whether we, can, we should maintain the current treaty arrangements, if we're going to move that, or we move away from the current treaty to a two-tier which has been in place since 1977, between 1977 and 95. Um, so those are the questions that are yet to be like, we need to find the answers to those questions. If we're going to move into one system, what about the current structural arrangements where you have three-tier, we maintain that or we move into two-tier? Th those are the things that we, we, we still yet to discuss with the people and the people have to, uh, during the consultation, that's an opportunity for them to discuss those things. And Malcolm, let me also mm -hmm. just add a little bit on this, that uh, we've gone through a progression. Uh, 1975, we have a centralized government system. Uh, we don't have a decentralized government system like the provincial government system. But then the country eventually realized, the government eventually realized that we need one. In 1977, we adopted the two-tier system, the provincial government system. It has worked for nearly uh, 10 years uh, at the most. Uh, 1977 to 1995, around 15 years. And then we decided to change that particular decentralized system to a three-tier system, which is the uh, national government, the provincial government, uh, and the local level uh, uh, government. What is important to point out is that they, they have their advantages, disadvantages. Uh, they have worked in other provinces since 1977 until 1995. They worked in other uh, provinces. Other provinces, they have not worked. Now we've adopted the 1995 model. They have not worked in uh, you know, uh, some provinces, other provinces, they have not worked. Uh, so there are good and bad sides to the system that we've uh, uh, adapted. Y you know, sometimes they always say that you have to allow the system to work for some time. And then you uh, begin to figure out what are the weaknesses, what are the strengths, and then you begin to work on those. Uh, and so we've gone through that particular uh, process. And I think through the Constitutional and Law Reform uh, Commission Directive Number uh, one. 1, 
uh, the directive number one, like similar one that we're working on right now, that we've gone through and re reviewing that particular uh, the system of government that we have. And one of the recommendations that we made w was to go back uh, uh, and adopt uh, what we refer to as an organic law on decentralization. And basically is to allow the country and the provinces which are ready to go through that particular process of decentralization, but more so towards autonomy. Uh, and I think that's the direction, the focus of our report that we looked at. And I think that particular report will be revisited when we go out into the provinces. And after 50 years, those are important, poignant issues that we need to look at uh, and begin discussing right now. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. We now go for a quick break. Join us on the other side for more discussions. Welcome back. You're watching In Focus. I still have Dr. Mange Matui, the Secretary for the Constitutional and Law Reform Commission. We also have Mr. Xavier Winia, the Director for the Legal Research and Publication Division of the Constitutional and Law Reform Commission. Gentlemen, before we start, the relevance of the English monarch as the head of state has been somewhat of a debate among several um, Commonwealth countries, as you mentioned, uh, similar jurisdictions. So, in recent times, um, a latest example would be Barbados, which in uh, 2021 it announced it would be leaving the Commonwealth to become a republic. And uh, it's removing the British head of state, as I believe. Uh, other countries like Jamaica and St. Lucia have also expressed similar sentiments. Can you explain why such debates on the future of the English monarch as the head of state have come about? And why is it important for us to discuss it in this review? Thank you very much, uh, Malcolm. Uh, I think that's one of the important issues also we are, we, we are taking out. And the countries that you name, Barbados, even Jamaica, uh, they've looked at the head of state, uh, the queen, uh, now the king, as the head of the state. And they're, they're having that national conversation about uh, whether or not to continue to maintain. When you talk about head of state, it's different from the head of government. Head of government is the prime minister. Uh, head of state uh, is completely different, and that's the, uh, the, uh, the king that we have. Uh, when you look at these countries like Caribbean countries, they've got a very painful history with the monarch. They've gone through you know, slavery. Yes, many of slavery. them have gone through uh, that, and many of their ancestors are slaves. Uh, and so the young generation is having that conversation about whether or not to continue to have that legacy, uh, being the, uh, 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 the head of state. So that's an important conversation these countries are having. We also had this conversation uh, uh, before we got independence, uh, whether to cut off our tie, our colonial tie, uh, with the queen uh, and with our colonizers. And, and that was a conversation that we, uh, we had. But then our forefathers decided that no, we continue to maintain uh, our historical tie and uh, the queen continues to be uh, our head of state. Other countries are having that conversation right now uh, because of the uh, sovereignty issues, independent issues. They're having that conversation right now. It is healthy for our society. It is healthy for our country to also begin to have this conversation and give this particular opportunity to our people to have the conversation. Maybe the Queen is way far away from Papua New Guinea. We don't have any sort of uh, con uh, co uh, connect or link or, uh, with the Queen. Uh, why don't we vote our own head of state uh, so that uh, you know we have the head of state who is the uh, representative of the people, the people's choice being voted in uh, to be acting as the uh, head of state. So uh, those are the conversations that uh, you know we should be having. Right now when you look at the role of the head of state, uh, head of state is basically playing a, a, a sort of a, a ceremonial uh, role. Uh, there is not, nothing substantive. Uh, so if you ref, uh, replace a queen as the head of uh, uh, state or king as the head of state in PNG, uh, what would be the consequence? So those are the things that we need to uh, also have a look at. But look, Malcolm, it is important for the viewers and the people of Papua New Guinea to have that conversation. And we are taking, uh, we are providing that platform, that venue for them to have that conversation. Uh, about whether or not the uh, queen or king should continue to be uh, the head of state. I think another, I think the most fundamental matter that this review will be covering uh, is the 
deciding on the tenure as well as the method and criteria for the nomination and election of the Prime Minister. Can you briefly explain the basic premise behind this particular? Uh, you know, the, the Prime Minister is a representative of people of Papua New Guinea. We must have someone who is a credible person going in and occupying that particular position. Right now, when you look at the issue of the election of the Prime Minister, it is the representative of the people are deciding uh, on who becomes uh, the Prime Minister. Uh, and I think the important uh, the issue that we are taking out to the people is that you tell us whether you want to elect the Prime Minister. Because when you look at the Constitution of Papua New Guinea, when you look at Section 99, and when you look at Section 100 of the Constitution, the powers of the people, the authority of the people is vested in the executive, in the legislature, in the judiciary. So it is the people's power that I'm acting on. It is the people's power that politicians in parliament are acting on. Then we have to take it back to the people and say, you want to remove that power from the elected representative and decide on the election of the prime minister. Because at the end of the day, it is your power delegated to us. And you decide on whether or not to elect the prime minister. So we are going back and uh, asking them about uh, that important question. Coming back to the issue ra you raised about uh, the qualification, uh, when the people decide whether or not to elect the prime minister, then we have to put in mechanism uh, and say, what kind of candidate should become the prime minister? Uh, is it going to be the people who are already elected through the uh, general election process? And then the pa uh, pa parliament then looks at those group of members and say, you are now fit and proper person to become the prime minister, so we send you back to the people to be elected by the people. And, and so that can be decided by them. Or how do we go about uh, in terms of nominating a person to contest uh, the position of the prime minister? So those are detailed matters that we can, uh, we can discuss uh, later. Uh, in terms of the electoral process, the question also we, we will be asking is, uh, what kind of process do you use? Do you use the first past the post? Uh, to elect the prime minister, or do you use the preferential voting system uh, to elect the prime minister? So once when that is done, then you look at it and say, do we go by the majority uh, uh, population choice or people's choice, or do we go by majority province or provinces uh, by majority have decided on a particular prime minister that we, uh, we go by uh, that particular candidate? So a lot of detailed issues that we, we still need to go through and consider, uh, deal with, uh, before we ultimately come up with uh, uh, a process, if the people decide to elect the prime minister, uh, put in a process that the election of the prime minister will be done uh, by the people. So you, you're not only looking at the uh, tip of an iceberg, but underneath you have to look at the wider issues uh, to be able to address uh, that particular um, uh, method that we are uh, uh, looking at right now. Thank you, gentlemen. Unfortunately, time has caught up with us. Very insightful discussions on our topic for tonight, the review of the form and systems of government and the election of the Prime Minister by the people. Before we go, I'd like to take this time to thank our special guests, Dr. Mange Matui, the Secretary for the Constitutional and Law Reform Commission, and Mr. Xavier Winia, the Director for the Legal Research and Publications at the Constitutional and Law Reform Commission. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. On behalf of the entire InFocus team, thank you for joining us and do join us next week for another episode of InFocus. Until then, good night from us. <laughs>